Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Trauma-Informed Care in the Classroom webinar. We're so pleased that you could join us today. My name is Bonnie Zampino. I'm the Engagement Specialist for UCARU Systems. Before we get started, I'd like to go over just a few housekeeping items so you know how best to participate in today's event. We have taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your own computer desktop in the upper right-hand corner. You're listening in using your computer's speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select the telephone in the audio pane panel and then the dial-in information will be displayed for you. We are eager for this to be as interactive as possible. So you will have the opportunity to submit questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the question pane of the control plant panel. You can send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. In addition, we welcome you to join us through this conversation on Twitter by using the hashtag StartsWithYou. To begin the conversation, I will now turn things over to Scott Zeter, Chief Operating Officer, of Grafton Integrated Health Network, and he is also a UKERU consultant. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Bonnie. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to be a part of this, talk a little bit about the work we've been doing at Grafton as it relates to uh, classroom use of trauma-informed care. So a little bit about what Grafton does. Uh, we're a large provider organization that was founded over 50 years ago uh, at the kitchen table of a, a woman who sought to homeschool her own son. And this expanded over time into a full continuum of care uh, for folks with intellectual disability, developmental delay, autism, or psychiatric disability. Uh, we start off in a public-private partnership early intervention service program serving children birth to three. We have applied behavioral analysis outpatient services, therapeutic day schools located in Richmond, Winchester, and in Berryville, uh, Virginia. We have a large psychiatric residential treatment center in Berryville, Virginia focused uh, on children and adolescents with significant uh, psychiatric disability. We have therapeutic group homes in the community in Winchester, Berryville, and Richmond. And we also are uh, the owner of a, an outpatient clinic uh, called Dominion Center for Behavioral Health Services located in South Riding, Virginia. So Grafton's philosophy has really evolved over time. I, some of the seeds of what we are as a company were, were, were to be found 50 years ago in the mind of Ruth Birch, but uh, over time, our philosophy is coalesced around trauma-informed care. Uh, we originally called it comfort versus control. We really feel at the end of the day it's our responsibility to teach the skills that allow our uh, children and adults to, to function uh, adequately in our classroom. We don't believe in uh, a client, quote, taking ownership for a problem per se, but we really feel like we need to teach the lagging skills that help them to succeed. We also believe in a strong sense of urgency. Urgency in action uh, in response to behavioral problems is the key to our success. So sadly, um, this is a very timely discussion. Nearly every day, uh, we see situations taking place in classrooms that are a cause for deep concern. There was a seven-year-old, for example, handcuffed during his after-school program for being hyper in Flint, Michigan. A South Carolina high school student forcibly was yanked from her chair and restrained in her classroom. Autistic children have been confined, sprayed with water, for example, in Maryland recently. Media coverage and several caught on cell phone videos have given the world a frightening glimpse of the trauma inflicted in the classroom as teachers and others use physical restraints on students. It is the zeitgeist now, and certainly social media and news outlets are, are very vigilant for stories regarding physical trauma against children at this time. The bottom line, though, is restraints are intended to contain a child or adult considered a danger to themselves or others. It's embedded within our history uh, as an uh, you know, as a discipline. As we've developed, many of the interventions that we traditionally thought were best practice have been revealed over time to be massively, un uh, massively full of unintended consequences. 
We believe that the use of physical restraint is becoming, frankly, an anachronism. We simply feel it, that its use does not provide a benefit that outweighs the risk of the intervention in the first place. In many of the examples I've mentioned, we question the need for restraint in the first place. At worst, restraint is an ineffective behavior modification technique that can have potentially deadly consequences. Without doubt, these actions result in trauma that can last a lifetime. What makes this complicated, however, is that most of us were raised in a system that encouraged us to proactively and physically intervene quickly, thus overwhelming situations before they got out of hand. We were taught to control. Problem is the road to hell is paved with good intentions. We know that trauma is the experience of violence and victimization, including sexual abuse, physical abuse, severe neglect, etc. everything you see here on the slide. What we are learning now is that it's a neurological phenomenon. Once the brain becomes acculturated to trauma response, it is more prone to be triggered to produce the same trauma behaviors that you were building in in the first place. So at the end of the day, we now know that in many ways the human brain is a pattern recognition machine that is designed to pull in stimulus and it will often respond to stimulus in very stereotypical and routinized way. So when we look at the prevalence of trauma, in 2013 CPS agencies received 3.5 million referrals involving 6.4 million children. You can see some of the data here on this slide. 678,000 children were victims of one or more instances of abuse or neglect. 1,484 children died from neglect and abuse in 2013 at all. If you take a look at the next slide, we're going to put this into something visual. This is the Redskin Stadium. It holds 92,000 people. In the next slide, you're going to see how many of those it would take in order to accommodate 679,000 children who were confirmed victims of abuse and neglect in 2013. You'd need seven and a half of the Redskin stadiums filled with traumatized children. That would be one heck of a classroom. So moving on, when we talk about restraint, we're looking here at, uh, in essence, the CMS definition. The bottom line is restraints compound the past traumatic experiences. The bottom line, it's, it's like a landmine. You don't know it's there until you step in it. While some may argue for the use of restraint as necessary, research indicates that these types of interven interventions actually cause, reinforce, and maintain aggression and violence. The reason is most likely tied to trauma. It's also important to note that while trauma is often thought of as as an experience of violence and victimization, it can also be caused by bullying, shame, fear, and anxiety, among other experiences. Children most at risk for behavioral problems in the classroom typically have a history of traumatic experiences. When a child is restrained, the current trauma is compounded by past experiences, leading to even more aggression and fueling a psychologically destructive cycle. The bottom line is many of our children come to us preloaded with previous trauma and clear neural pathways to violence. When we use physical interventions, we simply trigger the very neural patterns that we're so desperately trying to change. So about a decade ago, Grafton initiated an agency-wide restraint reduction program. So did everybody else. Uh, this was when there was a report that came out um, in the Hartford Quran about the use of uh, physical restraint and a lot of organizations engaged in activities. Um, our organization, uh, at the same time, had an insurance modification factor, which is basically a rating score of risk for an organization equal to that of the New York City Fire Department. We literally did hundreds of restraints a month. And frankly, the CEO had had enough. He issued a mandate to eliminate restraints without compromising employee or client safety. And our proof is in our results. Within 10 years, we've reduced the use of restraint by 99.8%. Through the minimization of restraint initiative, Grafton has reduced workers' compensation policy costs and employee turnover for a total return on investment of over $14 million. 
The organization has significantly reduced the number of injuries to both clients and those who care for them. Client injuries have been reduced by 41.2% from a high of 424 in fiscal year 05 to 168 in fiscal year 15. Staff injuries have gone from a high of 126 in 05 to 7 in 15. Next slide, please. Grafton's experience makes clear that restraint and seclusion can be eliminated without compromising safety as long as employees are properly trained. In 2015, with this experience behind us, we launched Ukuru Systems in order to help other organizations achieve similar goals. Ukeru, the Japanese word for to receive, is a safe, comforting, and restraint-free crisis management program developed by and for behavioral health professionals and paraprofessionals, educators, and parents. There's plenty of this on the website related to Ukeru Systems. It is the first crisis training program to completely eliminate the use of restraints and seclusion as accepted behavioral management tools. Ukeru focuses on engaging, sensing, feeling, and responding to what someone is trying to communicate through his or her actions while also maintaining the safety of everyone involved. Next slide, please. This is proof that with proper training on trauma-informed care and conflict resolution, as well as the physical techniques that minimize the need for restraints and seclusion, teachers and staff will be able to de-escalate conflict and divert aggression. Most importantly, they will ensure that everyone in the classroom is kept safe. The first step is to approach every situation from a trauma-informed construct, have the conflict resolution skills ready, to frankly teach new alternatives that the child may not be aware of, have physical techniques that are designed to keep you and the child safe, and the result is clear, elimination of restraint and seclusion. Grafton's niche in Virginia is to serve those who have been unsuccessful elsewhere. Frankly, as an organization, over our time, we have become the go-to provider for folks that are significantly complex. And we are able to manage that population with virtually no use of restraint whatsoever. The numbers don't lie. There is no reason to use the kind of force shown in the earlier real world examples. Alternative methods have proven to be successful by allowing organizations to significantly reduce the number of injuries to both children and those who care for them. Not only does legislation need to be passed to protect all students, but teachers and administrators need to be supported through training in communication, de-escalation, and trauma-informed care. We can eliminate restraint and ensure that we never again see a child unnecessarily traumatized in one of the places that they should feel the most secure, the classroom. Thank you so much, Scott. I would now like to introduce our next speaker. Annie Hudson Price. Annie is an attorney with Public Counsel, the largest pro bono law firm in the United States. Public Counsel is currently spearheading a class action lawsuit addressing the widespread, yet often ignored, adverse impact of childhood trauma on learning. Today she will be talking about recent rulings and pending litigation paving the way for trauma-informed care in the classroom. Annie, thank you for speaking with us today, and the floor is now yours. Thank you so much, Bonnie, and thank you so much to Ukeru for hosting this. This is such an important topic, and it's so it's inspiring to hear um, what everyone else is doing. And I'm sorry, I said Bonnie. I think I meant Kim. Um, it's so inspiring to hear what has been done already, and the results are really uh, exciting. So the Peter P. V. C. U. S. D. Compton Unified School District was a case we brought as a result of uh, other work we have done at Public Council. So first, just to explain what Peter PVC USD is seeking. It's seeking whole school trauma-sensitive practices to address the impact of complex trauma on the students in Compton. So Public Council is a nonprofit, as you can see in the slide, we're a legal services provider, and I work within the Opportunity Under Law unit at Public Council 
which uses <laughs> civil rights impact litigation to address economic injustice, particularly in cases of education and inequity. Uh, next slide, please. And here, before I get started, we're going to hear uh, from the named plaintiff in the case, and I'll tell you afterwards about a few of the other plaintiffs, but it's really uh, it's about the students and uh, hearing Peter's own words. Sorry, we're just having a little bit of. Oh, here we go. I've been through a situation. Before my mom got pregnant with me, and after she gave birth to me, my mom was doing drugs, and um, my dad was beating us. He had socked my mom in the stomach while she was pregnant with my little sister, and then he was gonna punch her again, and that's why I stepped in just me and then he, one day he came home drunk just went completely berserk and I got I panicked and I called 911 and that's where we were taking from our parents me seeing people get shot in my own neighborhood in my own everywhere I live is traumatizing when I'm walking home when I'm walking from home to school or I'm walking to school I don't have to be alert 24-7 because you never know someone's going to drive by and try to shoot you. I've been living at the school for two months. I've been through, I've been through rough situations. Before my mom got pregnant with me and after she gave birth to me, my mom was doing drugs. And um, my dad was beating us. He had socked my mom in the stomach while she was pregnant with my little sister. And then he was going to punch her again. And that's why I stepped in and he punched me. And then one day he came home drunk. He just went completely berserk. And I, got, I panicked and I called 911. And that's where we were taken from our parents. Me seeing people get shot in my own neighborhood, in my own, everywhere I live, is traumatizing. When I'm walking home, when I'm walking from home to school, when I'm walking to school, I don't have to be alert 24-7 because you never know someone's going to drive by and try to shoot you. I've been living at the school for two months. That's how bad the school is. You can't even notice that a student is living at the school. And where I was living was on the school roof above the cafeteria. I used three, four carpets. I put one to cover for the wind and the cold. And then I used one for I would lay down and one for a pillow. I want to figure out a way for the teachers to understand the students. I have flashbacks of what has happened to me when I was a kid. It either makes me mad or makes me sad or just like about to put my head down or just want to leave the classroom. And it's that's why a lot of students do that because it's either they've been they've been through something and that they don't want to open their mouth. Everyone has different experiences. Everyone's not built the same. We don't know what, what's going on in their houses. They're just so stuck. They trying to change but they can't. Because when they go home, it's negative. They go to school, it's negative. Down on the streets, it's negative. It's like, where is the positive part of in their lives? There is isn't. I have a peaceful place. And this peaceful place is when I'm in the mountains and I'm looking up at the stars. I would love to see my school as my peaceful place. Where I could be feeling safe, calm, don't have to worry about anything else. Trauma does affect the students. I want to make my school better because I want my kids to go there. And I want my kids to feel safe in that environment. Thank you. We can go to the next slide. 
Um, so, as you can hear from Peter's story, uh, these are students who have experienced severe trauma. One thing you didn't hear in that video, and for those, in case you were unable to hear, one, one came, became homeless after living in foster care and being adopted and then kicked out of his adopted parent's home. He was sleeping on the roof of the cafeteria in the school for two months. And when the school found out, he was suspended. And um, he was told that if he came back in before his suspension was up, that he would be arrested for trespassing. And as I'll talk about later, I mean, this is not that the school is evil at all. They didn't know how to handle the situation. Um, so this case came about from a public council mentioned we're in the impact litigation unit, but public council does an enormous amount of direct services. We work with students like Peter who have special education needs. Um, we also, the leader of our project, Mark Rosenbaum, has been doing his has been doing education equity litigation for 30 or 40 years. He's been working primarily around issues such as ensuring that students get textbooks, ensuring that students in a school in Compton have as many hours of class time as a student in school in Beverly Hills. And over the years of doing this work, he's um, coordinated with some really wonderful experts, including Marlene Wong at the USC School of Social Work. And she basically said to him at some point, look, this is all really important work, the textbooks, the facilities, the school hours, but that's all relatively meaningless if you can't address what students are bringing into school with them. So if you can't address the impact of childhood trauma, you are not going to be able to meaningfully address the achievement gap. So to tell you a little bit more about some of the other plaintiffs in this case, Philip saw his first execution at eight years old, and by execution, that's the phrase he used, he saw someone with a shotgun on his head on his knees in an alleyway, and then he saw him get murdered. He saw another one at 12. In this case, it was a, um, he saw someone's head get shot off and then thrown over a fence. Both of these things happened on the way to or from school. And he talks about, he said that 12 years old, he just felt a switch flip in his head, which is a pretty um, self-aware description. He's now 15. He was eventually incarcerated in seventh grade for stealing his aunt's car after having broken into his local elementary school in order to play basketball. He was sent to juvenile hall for um, a full semester. He when he broke into that elementary school to play basketball, when he was running away because the police were called, he was shot at by the police. He was later shot in the leg in a drive-by shooting. He and his brother had been kicked out of every school in Compton at some point in, fresh, in their freshman year alone. And he, what happened is he got sent to what's called Team Builders, which is sort of an alternative school program. In reality, what that meant was he was in school from 12 to 3 every day in a classroom with students of all ages, um, and he was given a packet of work. And for those of you who work with young people, you can imagine a 15-year-old who's already checked out slightly being given a packet of work to do in the classroom without real guidance. Um, that's, not, that's not getting an education. Uh, and he was there for months. His twin brother, Virgil, saw a... Uh, so his father pull a gun on his mother. When he was three, he has major anger problems, and he thinks it's largely because of the violence he witnessed as a child. And he also has been kicked out of every school in Compton. He talks about wanting to be a lawyer or a doctor or a real estate agent, which is uh, just like an amazing amount of ambition for someone at 15 in some of these communities. And he's already afraid that he is not going to be able to do it because he's been kicked out of every, fresh, of every school his freshman year of high school. Um, Peter, who you heard from in the video, he's currently not in school. He would be a senior. He really wants to get back to school, but because he's homeless, he's had to switch houses so often from couch to couch to couch. Um, and the reality is without education services, he hasn't been able to access social services. So we tried to help him with an access a number of other you know, food stamps, those sorts of programs, and he can't do a lot of that by himself because he can't read very well, and he doesn't have the confidence to interact with a lot of adults. Um, Dante, another student, tried to get counseling when he was 12, got frustrated with the counselor and slammed the door. He was suspended for several days. Kimberly, the only student above 18 who actually used her real name, and it's incredibly, I mean, I, she is my hero. She's completely 
her faith has become the faith of a lot of the media around the case um, and the confidence it takes to be open about what you're going through. Uh, she was sexually assaulted on the bus on the way to school, broke down in the classroom. Her teacher was shocked when he saw her crying, tried to get her services, um, and they just were unable to get her counseling. Uh, another student uh, went to his counseling office and said he was feeling suicidal tendencies. They said, your counselor isn't in today. You have to come back tomorrow. Uh, and this is only the academic counselors. He wasn't able to get to a mental health counselor because they weren't available for him. He came back the next day. They said, your counselor is still out sick. Come back the next week. The next week when he came back, his counselor told him, we can't help you. You need to go to the Compton Health Services and don't come back to school until you've gotten a note saying that they submitted him in school. Arthur, as you heard, similar to the stories you heard before, when he was 11, he, Arthur was in and out of foster care. His father found out about him when he was two and fought really hard to get him. Very involved father. At the age of 11, he got into a fight at school with another boy. There were no weapons involved. There was no serious violence and he was let off in handcuffs, sobbing. He's been suspended over 20 times. He also, at 12, was sent to team builders, where for months he was basically completely denied access to an education. And again, before I go forward, I just also want to say that this is not, these, these kids don't have post-traumatic stress disorder because there's nothing post about it. This, this is complex trauma and it is ongoing. Um, and I also want to say that if there are teachers that are plaintiffs in this litigation. We are not saying the teachers are the bad guy. We're not saying the school district is the bad guy. We're saying that there isn't the resources in place to, add, to sufficiently address the trauma that these students have experienced. And these teachers, they're not teaching in Compton because it's an easy buck. They're teaching because they care about the kids, but they don't have options. They don't, if a student is acting out because of their trauma in the classroom, that student is, the only option is to send them to the hall, to the office, kick them out into the hall where they will ultimately get some form of punitive discipline because there aren't any other programs in place. These kids are frequently told that they're stupid, that they're bad kids, that there's something wrong with them. And what what is so inspiring to me about these students is they are willing, a lot of these students will not get to see the benefits because by the time this is implemented, they will have graduated. These students are willing to come forward and say, there is not something wrong with us, something happened to us. And that's really what trauma-informed care on the broadest level is about. It's about saying to these students, not what's wrong with you, but what happened to you. Uh, next slide, please. So this, the legal framework for this case is the American with Disabilities Act and the Rehabilitation Act. And we deliberately, this is not a special education case. This is not brought under the IDEA. So the, and I'll talk about that more in a minute, but the American with Disabilities Act says, no qualified individual with a disability shall, by reason of such disability, be denied the benefits of a public entity. So that basically means that in the education context, a public school cannot deny a student access to an education because of their disability. And sort of the classic example of that is if a student that people think of, the classic example is if a student is in a wheelchair, you can't prevent them from accessing the building, you need to accommodate that disability by putting in a wheelchair ramp. Next slide. The key phrases here are meaningful access and reasonable accommodation. So the case law has, are, has found that the way to test whether or not someone is being discriminated against because their disability is to look into whether or not they are able to have meaningful access to the benefit being offered. So do these students have meaningful access to their education? And if they are not being given meaningful access, is there a reasonable accommodation that can be made to ensure they are given meaningful access? Again, the key sort of thing people think of is a wheelchair ramp would be a reasonable accommodation to ensure someone has meaningful access to their education. Next slide, please. So what is the definition of disability? In this context, it is a very broad definition. It is a legal construct, and it says it's a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. Next slide, please. <coughs> major life activities include learning, reading, concentrating, thinking, and communicating. So you can really see how broad this statute is. It's saying if, if a student has a mental impairment 
that substantially interferes with their ability to learn, read, concentrate, think, or communicate, they cannot be denied meaningful access to their education on those grounds. Next slide, please. Um, and, I, and I want to take a moment to say that, you know, I said this is not brought under the IDEA. This is not a special education case in the sense that we're saying these students need to be put into, given an IEP, need to be taken out of the mainstream classroom. And you'll, you know, I'm sure a lot of you on this call know that there is a substantial over-representation of African American and Hispanic students in special education programs. And we believe that is largely because of the way trauma has been handled. And again, I'll talk more about the proper remedies. You've already heard some of them. Um, but here, I just want to take a moment to say that this case is an interdisciplinary collaboration of brain science, social science, education experts, and really lastly, law. And again, you've heard a little bit about the brain science already. Sort of one, one important way I thought it was explained to us when we first got started, because we are not scientists ourselves, we are lawyers. When we first got started, one of the experts said, trauma is like when you play a record over and over again, and that groove, the record becomes, it becomes easier for that needle to fall into that groove. So when a student has been exposed to trauma over and over, and they've either had the heightened, adrenalized response of fight or flight over and over, they're more likely to hit that spot more quickly. Similarly, if a student has had the reaction of disassociating, of having their blood pressure, all of those factors go down, they're more likely to um, get to the point where they disassociate more quickly if they sense some sort of trigger or danger in their environment. I'll also talk about the social science statistics in a minute. And like I said, this is also education experts who have been working in these communities and looking at what services are effective given the population we're working with. Next slide, please. So I said childhood trauma can have lasting physiological effects on the developing brain. And like I said, again, freeze and surrender and fight or flight. Fight or flight are the two sort of standard responses. And these are often labeled as willful defiance or aggressive disruptive behavior. And the way it looks like, to give some examples from our students, sort of the fight or flight behavior, Peter P., the student you heard from in the video, he, because he was sleeping on the roof, he was exhausted. He fell asleep in class one day with his head on his desk. The teacher, well-meaning, thought it would be funny to wake him up by dropping a book on the desk to make like a loud noise. Given his experience with extensive violence in his community, he woke up, came up swinging, and punched the teacher without even really having a second to process what had happened. And the teacher, understandably, had to send him to the office, and he ends up getting suspended. Um, if the teacher had had the training and the resources to know it is not a good idea to drop a book and create a loud noise for a student who has pretty evidently experienced extensive trauma, this whole situation could have been avoided. Similarly with Kimberly, she talks about being in class after the sexual assault. She would completely tune out. She would start to think about it and her brain would just shut down. And so a teacher would ask her a question and she would panic because she hadn't been able to connect to the environment, wouldn't know what had been asked of her. And so she would just continually shut down further. She wouldn't answer, she would get silent, and the teacher would assume that she was being willfully defiant, was deliberately avoiding interacting and creating trouble. Um, and so to oversimplify, the, the cortex, the part of the brain that is necessary for higher level functioning, such as the learning, concentrating, thinking, those um, behaviors that are considered substantial, sorry, they're considered major life activities I outlined before, these are all significantly interfered with when you've experienced complex, extensive trauma. Uh, next slide, please. So the social science also tells an incredibly stark story. Students with repeated exposure to traumatic events, as you can see in the slide, are 2.5 times more likely to repeat a grade, four times more likely to experience academic failure, five times more likely to have serious attendance issues, six times more likely to experience behavioral problems. And this is controlling for socioeconomic status and other consequences, other community factors. So this is, they actually have found that trauma is the most predictive factor other than whether or not a student is in special education of academic success. Next slide, please. Um, 
So why Compton? We could have certainly brought this case in a number of places. This is not, as you heard before, a trauma is heartbreakingly pervasive in America right now. But Compton has a particularly disturbing situation with community violence and with poverty given generations of disinvestment in the community. So the homicide rate is Compton, in Compton is five times the national average. The rate of families living in poverty is twice the national average. And on top of that, it's severely under-resourced. So as I've heard, as a gentleman, I've heard speak many times, K. Ron Valentine from Live, Rise Above the Hype has said, equal is not equal in these situations. So just giving these students the same services as in Beverly Hills would not actually create equal educational opportunity. But they're not even equal. They're actually severely under-resourced. So at the time we filed the suit, Compton had fewer than 24 psychologists and counselors across the 25,000 student district. So that's on average one counselor for 1,000 students. In contrast, Beverly Hills had nine counselors and psychologists for 1,800 students. So they had about one to every 200 students, more than all three Compton high schools combined. Next slide, please. So what are the remedies that must be taken? And so as I said, this is not a special education case. Well, in some circumstances, IEPs, intensive individual interventions are going to be necessary. This is really about whole school trauma-sensitive approaches. And they have been successfully implemented in schools with similar demographics to Compton. Next slide, please. So in this case in particular, the reasonable accommodations we are seeking are training to recognize trauma and its effects and how to respond to training for all teachers and staff, so everyone who interacts with these students, so that they can recognize that when a student is acting out in class, maybe it's not willful defiance, but that it's coming from a place of trauma and experience. And then they can be trained in how to react to that. And to this end, Bruce Perry, one of the experts in the case, has given, has told us, he actually once spoke, told us he gave a one-day training at a school in either South Carolina or North Carolina, I can't remember which right now, where he had, the school had horrible outcomes. They had terrible student attendance, terrible, terrible teacher attendance, no graduates yet. It was for students who had been kicked out of every other school. And um, incredibly high suspension rates. Just one day of training had a substantial impact on all of that. They had their first round of graduates, teacher and student attendance rates went up and suspensions went significantly down. Building social emotional learning skills in a proactive and stable classroom is also crucial, integrating those programs into the curriculum at the school. Restorative justice instead of punitive remedies, recognizing that when these students act out, they are not quote unquote bad kids, and that actually they need service and help and connection to their communities rather than punitive discipline which perpetuates the trauma. And then mental health support for the students who need it. So for those students who are coming in saying that they're experiencing suicidal ideations, we be able to immediately connect them to a mental health counselor. Next slide, please. So what is the current status of the litigation? We have survived a motion to dismiss, which means a federal judge has said that, yes, this case has merit. Complex trauma, as described here, may very well be considered a disability under the terms of the Americans with Disabilities and Rehabilitation Acts, and that the case is not going to be thrown out on the initial filings alone. So we are currently engaged in court order mediation with the school district, and we're very optimistic about next steps. And the exciting thing is we, have, we do have a, a written ruling, which you can find online, and I am happy to make it available afterwards, um, where you can see the judge saying that this is something that must be taken care of, and it can be a tool for other school districts, other communities to spur action by showing that actually you might get sued if you don't. And next slide, please. So if you have any questions for me, this is my contact information. You can also see the video we showed earlier, as well as all of the filings in the case, including the complaint, 
the expert declarations, some of the academic literature we cited in the complaint. That's all available at our website, traumaandlearning.org. And then if you want to learn more about public counsel, you can find our uh, the organization's website at the bottom. And again, I spoke about some of the remedies, but these are what we are seeking in this case. They are broad. They are often going to be tailored to the district that is seeking services. And uh, I really look forward to answering your questions at the end of this. And now I will turn it back to Bonnie. Thank you. Thank you so much, Annie, for that um, eye-opening and, and heartbreaking overview. Um, our final presenter today is Jeremy Aldridge. He's the Director of Education, Consultation, and Development for Grafton Integrated Net Health Network. Jeremy is going to speak today about practical approaches for trauma-informed care in the classroom. Um, and just to let you all know who are asking about the slides, those will be sent around uh, to the participants today. Um, this is also being recorded uh, if you would like to listen to that at a later time. But for now, I'd like to turn this over to Jeremy. Thank you, Bonnie. Well, given my experience as both a special education teacher and, a, and an administrator at a residential treatment center, uh, I'm certainly happy to share some practical approaches to creating a trauma-informed approach in the classroom. Um, this, will, this can be achieved by recognizing the various elements that contribute to your classroom and to your students' behaviors. But while I'll be sharing some of these practical approaches, if following this presentation you wish to receive additional training, I would highly encourage you to seek assistance from your administrators to, to be properly deployed into the classroom as Annie just thoroughly explained to us the inadequacies of training that we see elsewhere. Okay, so for, for the classroom itself, um, we've, we've got some, if we can go to the prior slide, please. Thank you. Um, while this is a linear, it looks a little more linear in the presentation, um, we do recognize that this is more of a, it can even be more of a cyclical relationship between uh, the environment, both outside of the classroom as well as what you'll see in your classroom, um, interdependent upon your, your behavior in both that environment and how you interact with the students and then certainly the manifestation of the student's behavior and how that plays in the environment. Next slide, please. As Annie mentioned earlier, um, certainly the stories are heartbreaking. And these are things, of course, when we look at students' home life or social histories, many times when they enter our classrooms, particularly in the public school setting, uh, we're really not aware of what's going on if the student hasn't been referred to the guidance office or to a counselor or if perhaps they just move into your district, um, you may be completely unaware of what's going on. Um, certainly, when Annie's talking to us about a student who's breaking in at the elementary school or getting shot at by the police or getting shot in a drive-by, I mean, we, we all, you know, we're keenly aware of Maslow's hierarchy that safety and security has to come first before we can ever achieve any sort of academic performance standards in our classrooms. And so we know that that's a setting event for our environment. Likewise, in the second bullet, as you can see, uh, recognizing the dynamic that impacts the classroom environment itself. Uh, we, we see it on the headlines all the time about violence in the, in the classroom or in the hallways of our schools. That's why it's been such a, a strong uh, safety presence in public education in the last 20 years is establishing a safe school environment. Uh, not just from, of course, the, the worst of all outcomes, such as an active shooter, but even physical violence as, as we've seen with groups of students being aggressive to one another. And as, as Annie mentioned earlier, and I'll certainly articulate later in the presentation, that's not just trauma that our students experience, that's also a safety concern that you as an educator or the paraprofessional in the classroom have to face as well. And, and to even heap on to that uh, potentially traumatic environment, uh, we also recognize that there are pressures in the classroom just based on student performance. Uh, you think of pacing guides and districts and we, which we work with and we know that teachers are provided with those um, with pretty rigid guidelines about what portions of the content need to be covered in particular weeks. Um, the attitudes of those administrators that are pushing the pacing guides um, as well as test performance. I mean it's a very, it's a very real <laughs> environment out there where teachers are being um, paid based on the the performance of their students. Their compensation packages will vary based on um, the outcomes 
of these tests. And unfortunately, as we've seen, um, the results of that anxiety and that trauma have been manifest in ways in which we wouldn't have thought 20 years ago, where we've got entire districts of administrators who uh, fudge the test results, or there's um, questions of integrity. Likewise, if you're a special education teacher, um, certainly you recognize the, the anxiety that can exist as you're really trying your best to implement the IEP for your students. And in most cases, special education teachers um, aren't just implementing one student's IEP. They could be several in the classroom. Um, as Annie mentioned and as is experienced uh, nationwide many, in many school districts, um, our special education teachers are working in uh, very under-supported um, ratios of students where they may have 10, 15, 20 IEPs that they're tracking. And, and as she mentioned, they're trying their best, um, but it's certainly impacting the environment. And, and it's going to, it could color your perspective in terms of managing your own behavior. Next slide, please. So there's triggers. These are triggers that our students will face. If they're in your classroom, um, if they're feeling lonely, those same students that are experiencing trauma outside of the classroom, we recognize many times, unfortunately, too often after the fact that we've seen a manifestation of a, of a behavior is that they were withdrawn, um, that they didn't feel that they were interconnected with their peers. Um, certainly, our society has become more savvy to understanding the effects of bullying, whereas 50 years ago, that was a way of life. We now recognize acutely the impact of bullying, both in person and then with cyberbullying, with the um, continued evolution of electronics uh, in our life. For our students who are struggling with um, academic performance, the feeling of confusion or being anxious. I know for many times as I taught in our residential treatment center, um, this was the impetus for, for many of the behavioral outbursts, simply because our students were struggling primarily first with a learning disability. Um, unfortunately, um, they felt such pressure socially to fit in with their peers that their escape from feeling that confusion was to act out uh, in the hopes that they could escape it. Anniversaries and dates even. Um, if we've got a student who's been traumatized at a particular day of the year, many times um, in our setting, we recognize that if, if someone has been uh, perpetrated on October 12th, every year around that time of year, we know that there's going to be an escalation of behaviors simply due to the trauma history of the student. And likewise, uh, as you can see, the other bullets, certainly things that we would recognize could be potentially traumatic or, or triggering a trauma response. Next slide, please. So I certainly want to agree with Annie that while the actual diagnosis might be PTSD, there certainly isn't anything post about the trauma that our students um, are experiencing. It's living and it's breathing in their lives every day as they enter our classroom. Um, it could manifest itself with a trauma response as we were trying to go through the day. And again, think about all of those environmental pressures that are being placed on you as an educator uh, within the system, um, socially, if it's in an environment that's unsafe. Um, but look at the warning signs, and I think key one would be um, to develop that relationship with your students. I think more so than anything else, if, for a practical approach to trauma-informed care, it's the relationship that's key. And I know if you're in a classroom now and you're, you've, you were nodding your head when I was talking about test performance stressors and administrators who are really pushing the pacing guides, I know that, that as you walk in the door Monday morning at 8 a.m., that may be the, the last thing that you have on your docket. But I, I assure you that it is the most practical and important tool in your toolbox is to get to know your students. And then as you do, see these early warning signs. Um, for some of our students, we recognize something as innocuous as a bouncing leg um, may just be a way to, to um, manage their attentional difficulties or um, if they feel like they've got a lot of energy but they need to stay in their seat. Whereas for other of our students, we recognize that that same signal actually means that they're escalating, that they're upset. 
most of these warning signs are, are, are traditionally quite individualized. Um, some, however, like clenching fists, um, rocking or, or not sitting still may have um, a universal uh, translation, but still, if you get that relationship built with your students, I think that you're going to be most poised for success. Next slide. Next slide. So in terms of key features of a trauma-informed approach, um, as we always teach and as we, as we live it, um, safety is job one. And so recognizing that we're not going to get those test results and we're not going to plow through the pacing guide if our classroom is in an uproar and if people feel unsafe. Um, we have to make sure that everyone feels safe. And that's you, for you too as the educator, as a professional. Um, we, we can't expect you to be at your best if you're existing in the same reality that some of your students might be, which are feeling anxious and feeling threatened. Um, so we want to make sure everyone feels safe. Looking across that list, with collaboration with all stakeholders. I think that's really essential, um, not just within your school, where you may have resource staff or other teachers, the gym teacher or the library teacher, folks that will see your students in other settings. Um, certainly sharing information is key. Um, I think collaborating as well with your administra administration, but your parents as well. And I know in, um, in some communities, maybe that is difficult based on the dynamic around the school. Um, but there are resources out there, and I know that maybe later we'll get some questions about what would we do if we if we recognize the triggers of one of our students, and if we recognize that um, there's difficulties going on, but you're just you're just trying to get by to the day, and you're really trying hard, but you're not sure. You've talked to your administrator, and, and like the case, one of the cases that Annie mentioned earlier, where um, the teacher did recognize that the student had some difficulties, and they were trying to seek aid, but they couldn't. Um, there are community organizations out there that I, I would encourage you. Big Brothers and Big Sisters is a great one. Anyone um, with a mentoring capacity where you have someone that might be able to, to attach to the student and check in on them. Um, even local social workers or social work departments. Um, if, it's, if it's been a tra traumatic history for your student, there is a likelihood that someone in the local, local social worker office, um, they, they may already have a case file there may be something already going on. Um, in terms of empowerment, let's think about the traumatized youth. If you've been a victim, uh, that control over your life could have been revoked. If you've been perpetrated, um, you really, you're, you, everything has turned topsy-turvy, and so you probably don't feel as though you have much choice, that you have much control. Um, so for four and five, you know, in terms of really easy practical applications of trauma-informed approach, you can give your students choices. Um, we, we call it comfort versus control, that we want to be comforting. If we think about uh, if you've had a really bad day and you come in the door and your significant other is waiting on you, wouldn't you rather them to be at their best when you're at your worst? So giving them voice and choice and empowering them. And it doesn't have to be significant. I mean, you can still meet your academic objectives. You can still kind of keep the, the rudder on the ship pointed in the right direction for what you wanted to do for the day. But, but perhaps when Johnny starts to escalate, and you know Johnny actually likes helping, uh, you give Johnny a choice of one of your classroom tasks. Like maybe today Johnny can help erase the, the dry erase board. Not only are you providing Johnny with a physical outlet where he can move, but you're also giving him a sense of self-worth. You're giving him a, an ability to contribute to the class in a way that's positive. And in terms of positivity, think about your, and number six there, a positive peer culture. Because while we're well intended, we all remember the days when we were in school and, and how much more likely were we to listen to our friends versus listening to a teacher or our parents. Um, having a good positive culture in your, a peer culture in your classroom is just an incredibly powerful tool. And an easy way to get that going is just encouraging, or just recognizing students when they're being good, to catch them being good, as we say. Um, develop some positive momentum in terms of behavioral outcomes, and then it's infectious, just like the, the contrary would be, um, as, you, as you may or may not have seen in classrooms, where if one student becomes disruptive, you might see, uh, in terms of <coughs> responding to an unsafe environment, other students become disruptive. 
I just want to encourage you that uh, the contrary can also be uh, achieved through solid behavioral programming and just catching them being good. And then number seven, um, you think about strength-based outcomes for your students. Ms. Annie, as she reported and as unfortunately we read in many of our <laughs> students' case files, so many times our students are told that they're not worth anything or they're not good. Um, and imagine how we would react if we easily receive that same feedback from those around us that we perceived as authority figures. <laughs> it could be, it could be devastating. So, thinking of ways of how you can recognize your the strengths of your students. So, for example, like our our case with Johnny, maybe he has the best handwriting in the classroom. So, you have Johnny write the schedule of events every morning, and then. Maybe someone else is a helper with um, taking out the trash um, and tell them, you know, you're really strong. I like how you, you take that out for us. Recognizing strength, even as you, you might think that they're, they're minimal or they're, maybe they're not that important in terms of, well, it's, it seems kind of silly. I mean, having them right on the board, but just think about it from their perspective, that you're, you're giving them a, a role in the classroom, an active one, where they're, they're not just required to be seated and to follow all controls. For the next two slides, in terms of trauma-informed approaches in the classroom, we've got a scale from one to ten of a few examples of, of what we see, what we have seen manifested both in our own organization in years past or, or as we've worked with school systems or other organizations. I just encourage you to, to look at, at this Likert scale here and, and think about it in your environments, in your classrooms. On the left-hand column, we would consider these to be very trauma-uninformed environments. Um, as Ms. Annie mentioned earlier in her present, portion of the presentation, um, others quote it as willful defiance, um, where behavior seen as intentional or provocative, um, that they're just seeking out to hurt someone. Whereas in a trauma-informed classroom, we understand that there are that behaviors occur for a reason, and that we try to seek the the uh, root for the behavior. Or in a trauma uninformed environment, we label our students. Johnny's manipulative. Johnny's attention seeking. Instead of using neutral language and recognizing that Johnny is responding to traumas that have, have have existed in his life and the impact that that has on his behaviors. We, we, we frequently call it behavioral CSI, where we're really trying to get to the root of the issue and support the students. Um, and tra trauma uninformed environments, coming and going from the classroom without acknowledging your students. Um, whereas in the trauma informed environment, we do say hello or goodbye. If we're a, if we're a speech pathologist or an occupational therapist, we might only see the student for an hour or so. Something as simple as a, as a smile and a hello, how are you, Johnny? Uh, it go a long way for setting the, the environment and developing trust and building that relationship is so important. And finally, so in trauma uninformed environments, there are group seating arrangements. Um, Furniture is placed against the wall. Uh, folks are seated in a way where their, their back could be to the door. Um, whereas with a trauma-informed environment, we have individualized areas. Think about, as Scott mentioned, the prevalence of trauma and the, and the horrific things that our students may have experienced. They're really wanting to establish a safe space. So if you place us all in a large group in your classroom, you can imagine all the various dynamics that could exist there. But if you, if you were to provide that, that student Johnny with a safe space, maybe an individual seat, or even a, a corner of the room, um, somewhere where he or one of his, student, his peers, one of your students, could go to relax, they could go to decompress. And it also gives you a great opportunity as a, as a professional in the room to, to go over and check in with Johnny. Maybe even establish a, a practical um, and a, a non-disruptive way to communicate. Um, in some classrooms, what we've train and what we've seen, we have a, a red card, green card, so that if I'm feeling upset, I flip it from green to red and I go over to the designated area and I have a seat. And then that gives 
the teacher an indication that something's going on and that Johnny needs to have a conversation or Johnny needs to check in. And the next, in this slide, in terms of calming strategies, these are things that you can incorporate in your classroom that's going to help calm. Um, the alert center and the traumatized brain, the amygdala, is firing. And what we've got to do is we really got to arrest it. We have to provide a sense of calm. And, and many times we can integrate sensory activities that will assist. Um, you see deep breathing, um, stuffing, hugging a stuffed animal. If you've got a student with, who's receiving occupational therapy, uh, I highly recommend that you speak with your OT about um, the integration of body socks or, or any compression devices that the student may want to request when they're feeling agitated because that, that could also help calm. Um, in some classrooms what we found is, is even something as simple as a, a small jump trampoline placed in a corner that's not as disruptive but it certainly provides exercise and, and um, physical feedback to the student that will really help them calm down. And likewise too, um, as we go to the next slide, don't forget about yourself. Those same calming strategies that, that you want to utilize to assist the student in the classroom, I highly encourage you to do the same because we're not working with light bulbs. But we've got fragile students um, in a very fragile environment in terms of emotionally that it's charged. Um, and so we're going to be reactive. We have to understand that it can be traumatizing to you. So I encourage you to take good care of yourself as well. Um, develop a relationship with those that are around you. If it's not your immediate supervisor, maybe it's the head teacher of your department. Um, maybe it's your peer across the hall. And ask for support. Because the great thing is that you've got folks around you who could likely be tackling or trying to tackle the same issues. Maybe they're the behavioral CSI in their classroom and the two of you get together, um, perhaps you've discovered something that works. Um, so you're a great resource to one another. And then seek out those training opportunities if you feel unprepared. Um, if you've got a student who comes in with that's experienced a particular type of trauma that you've not been accustomed to or they have a, a sensory need that um, you feel is beyond your, your professional experience, this is a great opportunity for you to reach out and maybe connect with someone in your building that you haven't previously. Just creating a, an environment of mutual respect and in the community um, between your students and yourself so that um, you all recognize that you do want to be there feeling safe and certainly all those other factors in terms of academic performance or outcomes can be sure to follow if you can establish that. And so that, uh, I think we're ready to take some questions. Is that correct, Monica? That's absolutely right, Jeremy. Thank you so much for giving us those practical tips on how to make the classroom more trauma-informed. Um, we do have a few questions that have come in, so um, we're going to ask the panel um, to give us some feedback on those. But just to let the audience know that um, you can still uh, send in your questions uh, using the chat. Uh, panel on your control panel. And we will try to get to as many of those as we can in our remaining time. Um, if for some reason we can't get to your question before the end of the webinar, um, which will be in just about um, seven minutes, then we will try to follow up with you with a response. Um, so one of the first questions that we got in, and this would be for Scott, Karen, <coughs> and Annie, is um, from one audience member who is very interested in creating trauma-informed um, education system and, and also um, just a, a trauma-informed community and would like to know if students can teach each other about trauma. So I'd love to know your thoughts on that. I've had several really powerful moments in my professional life where I've seen this happen. First was in a residential treatment facility uh, in which um, I walked in on a clinical director working with a bunch of older adolescent males who uh, had all been extremely violent in their history. A lot of the psychiatric uh, problems that they were suffering were caused. Anyway, he, he walks, I walk into the room and he's doing mindfulness techniques with these guys. He's doing imagery and meditation. Um, I would have never thought it was possible, but it is possible. And frankly, he kind of created a mutual, mutually supportive environment where they felt safe doing that. Um, so some of these things that we assume never would work actually do work. The other one is we have a, 
in our in our residential treatment center here at Grafton, we have a uh, you know uh, several units of very young children, um, 10, 11, 12, many of them sexually traumatized or physically traumatized. And one of our staff members has taken the lead on doing conflict resolution with these folks. And you know, initially I thought, how much processing can a kid do um, at age 10 or 11 in terms of the complex social dynamic between them and some other kid? <coughs> um, the reality is they do it quite well. Um, these kids are doing a guided activity with her. Uh, in a special space that we created that is used only for conflict resolution. And as a result, we saw a very clear uh, and very irrefutable drop in our peer-to-peer -peer, uh, aggression incidents with that population. So they just weren't popping off uh, with each other as much. So, uh, you know, I've, I've just had several lessons where the, the things I thought were improbable or not possible, in fact, were as long as somebody took the risk to try it. Excellent answer, Scott. Annie and Jeremy, do you have anything to add to that? But just anecdotally, being at the Residential Treatment Center and seeing the difference in the environment with the inclusion of that um, conflict mediation has just been a powerful thing to witness. Um, it, it's palpable. You can tell the difference. And it, essentially, though, the students have to be prepared and willing to engage in something of that nature. That, that's not something that we want to force. Um, it's certainly something we want to welcome, um, but it's not going to work unless both students, if they're, if they're um, two that are antagonistic with one another, if they're both willing to reach a resolution. Um, and Annie, maybe you can handle the follow-up. Um, I think the, the audience member was also wondering if students can actually provide trauma-informed training to other students within the school. I know um, here at Grafton and with Ukeru when we train, we often um, put out uh, just a notice to those who are participating that just the training alone can sometimes raise issues for adults. So how would this work with students training other students? Any thoughts? Well, I think that it's long, what, what our experience with the conflict resolution program that we're now implementing in our residential treatment center, you know, we have to, it has to be guided. Um, because otherwise you can unwittingly bring over triggers um, that, that, that that pattern in motion of, of uh, the trauma response. Um, you know, I think that you have to be willing to, um, you have to be willing to try. And I think most of us have been acculturated that there are certain ways the classrooms are supposed to look and certain ways that, you know, students are supposed to behave. And uh, until you begin to really question some of your thoughts and biases related to that in view of the fact this strange new world we're in where we are looking at everybody's individual symptom complex and having to take into account what we might be doing to unwittingly trip trip them into a, a you know the, the a pattern of behavior we don't want to see unless you're willing to be creative and try that um, you'll never know what the potential is for example, at Grafton, when I, I joined Grafton after it had already had success with its restraint reduction initiative, and my initial thought as a, a social worker, as a practitioner, and as an administrator of, of behavioral health care facilities was, well, you know, that, that blocking um, uh, use of pads as opposed to physically containing someone may work with a developmentally disabled student, but it sure as heck isn't going to work with a psychiatrically angry adolescent male. Well, I was wrong, apparently. I mean, our residential, we are having maybe one restraint um, or two restraints a month at this point, which is pretty amazing because we're one step away from a psychiatric hospital level of care. So That's really informative and hopefully answered the, the question that our audience member had. We only have about two minutes 
left. So another question that came in, if we could look at that briefly, is how in-depth or extensive does a training need to be in order to um, meet the requirement of being trauma-informed? Is there a definition or a guideline for that? I'm going to pass this one to Jeremy as the, <laughs> the teacher, but the reality is as long as you can ingrain the idea of the neurological underpinning of it, it gets a lot easier. If you can describe the brain as a pattern recognition device that predisposes you to behave the same way in terms of certain stimuluses, if you can sell that idea, you can actually, can actually, um, I think, be be very successful uh, in in helping people understand this. And I think you can you can powerfully do it even even within a day's worth of, of training. I, mean, I think the most essential concept is that it has to be a cultural change. Um, too often what we see in schools, of course, is, as I mentioned earlier, is that it's controlling environment. Um, because there are so many um, factors in play, we really want to respond by satisfying all these other requirements. We're very controlling. What we've got to do is we've got to get to that, that environment of comfort versus control. And so we want to teach the professionals that are in the building um, how to look and really change their perspective. I think if you can do that um, either through um, maybe experiences within your classrooms, um, it could be a good opportunity for you to, to co-train with some of the other educators in your building, uh, sharing experiences that you've had, or even looking at some literature. There's a lot out there that, to discuss what trauma-informed approaches look like in a school um, and how then you could, as a team, move forward to make that a, a part of your culture. It is a powerful way to, to convert the environment. Excellent answers. Thank you, gentlemen, so much. Um, I want to be sensitive to everyone's busy schedules, and we're now at 2.15, so we're at the conclusion of our time together. I'd like to, again, thank our panelists, Scott, Annie, and Jeremy, for providing us with such great information today. I'd also like to thank everyone who joined us in this discussion. Um, we certainly hope that this is not the end of this dialogue, but really just the beginning of this really important conversation. Um, and to stay in touch, be sure to follow the hashtag uh, starts with you on Twitter. Um, additionally, if anyone's interested in looking further into trauma-informed care training, um, the info at ukerusystems.com is a good email address to use for that as well. So again, on behalf of Ukeru Systems and our presenters, we'd like to thank you for joining us today and have a wonderful rest of your day.